Hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 2 of the Equip Math Professional Development Series. Today is Episode 4, Complex Geometry with the New Formula Sheet. Uh, this is actually a recording. Our, originally was, our original was done on January 14th, but due to technical issues, we do not have access to that recording. So this is a redo of that. Uh, my name is Kristen Knudsen, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of myself, Abby Rosa, Amy Vickers, and Amber Deliger, who was our tech consultant for the original airing. Uh, this webinar is a recording. Um, during the original, we were able to chat and incorporate those uh, participant features into the presentation. Um, Our objectives for today are to identify common types of geometry prompts, list the levels of knowing that we have identified as needing more development in our learners, and finally identify strategies for preparing learners to solve complex geometry problems. And we're glad to have you here. Hi, welcome everyone. This is Amy. And um, I also just wanted to remind you that with, along with this webinar are a set of free printable materials. So um, we put these materials together as we were developing this webinar. If you attended the live webinar, those came in an email to you. And um, otherwise, all of those materials are available at the ATLAS website at atlasabe.org. Um, I just want to mention the new formula sheet. Um, so this for, the new formula sheet was included in the pre-work for this episode. And it's very easy to find online. Um, just make sure that you're looking at the current version. The formula sheet has been revised one time since the formula sheet for the 2014 GED test was released. Um, another thing I want to mention are the CCRS mathematical practices. Um, these practices are taken from the College and Career Readiness Standards for Adult Education, and this is also easy to find online. So um, the practices describe habits and thinking that lead to success in math. And um, I just want to say that specifically, this webinar really emphasizes mathematical practice number one. Um, in, so in preparation for this webinar, we discovered that there are actually three common types of geometry prompts. Um, the simple, the missing component, and the complex. So the, the simple is, the, is um, it's all relative, I guess, but the, what we're calling simple is just the, the type of geometry prompt where the variables in the formula are arranged to just give you the answer. So if you're asked to find the volume and the formula is set up where the, the V for volume is by itself on one side of the equal sign. So that we're calling that one simple. And then um, the other type is the missing component. And that's in that type, you also can work directly with the formula, but the, the variable that is unknown is, is, is mixed in to the formula, so you have to sometimes, uh, what, what we're calling like work backwards to, to find that answer. So it's just a little bit, takes a little bit more um, algebra skills to work with this type of problem. And then the third type of geometry prompt is the complex. And this, in a, in a complex geometry prompt, that's where you would need to do some figuring in order to find a missing component that you would then need to plug back in to a, a different formula to, to solve the, the problem at hand. So um, actually, Equip Season 1, Episode 5 actually addressed the first two types of geometry prompts very well. And a link to that recording was included in your, um, your pre-work for this webinar. But if you missed that, then you can also find that on the Atlas website. And um, so today, we're going to be focusing on that third type, the complex. 
the complex type of geometry prompt. Um, so to prepare for this webinar, Abby and Kristen gave geometry prompts to their students and asked them to work with the prompts and write out their problem-solving processes. And, and then Abby and Kristen analyzed and summarized the responses that their students gave. And then from those summaries, we were better able to identify the gaps in working with the complex geometry problems. So, you know, the question that we were really asking was, what is stopping the students from making sense of these complex problems and persevering in solving them? Okay, so um, we're going to look at one of the complex problems. This is Abby. We're going to look at one of the complex problems um, that, that Amy was talking about. Um, so I'm going to show you the problem, and I want you to think about um, what would the problem solver need to know, and what would be difficult, or where might a problem solver, solver get stuck. Okay. So a company makes filters in the shape shown. Each filter is three and a quarter inches wide at the top and holds up to uh, eight and three tenths cubic inches of liquid inside. To the nearest tenth of an inch, what is the surface area of the smallest rectangular box that co could contain the filter? Um, so as we think about what our students might have trouble with um, in the original webinar, um, uh, participants mentioned just knowing the formulas for the shapes, identifying what the shapes are, um, being able to solve for um, the various values, um, just getting stuck not knowing where to start, um, uh, being confused about um, what volume means or what the different dimensions mean or how, they, how those are related, um, also just dealing with a, a problem that has so many different steps and not getting stuck partway through or getting confused as to what to do first. Um, there's also different shapes we're dealing with, so di um, differentiating the surface area of the box versus the surface area of the filter, um, deciding which formula to use. Um, let's see, and you, I'm sure, can come up with other um, questions or concerns that your um, students might address. So today we're going to look at some of the places where our students got stuck and some of the things that we saw um, as ways to help the students um, move through that and um, be able to uh, successfully solve complex geometry problems in, on tests or in real life. Um, as we um, were talking about the different um, places the stu that our students got stuck as we looked at their work, as Amy mentioned, um, and thought about how to get them to the next step. We started calling them bridges, so thinking about like what can we do to bridge the students from where they are um, to where they could be as proficient solvers of complex problems. Um, and Amy mentioned the mathematical practices. We're really thinking here about um, mathematical practice one, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Um, um, although the other practices um, certainly come in will come in as well as we discuss. Um, this is Kristen Knutson here, and what we were really surprised to find was that our students needed to go back to the basics. Um, we had a student with limited geometry experiment, experience who was shown a picture of a cone, and when they saw it, they thought it was a triangle. Other students could not identify what the dotted line means. Um, that's present in some of those line drawings to represent three-dimensional shapes. Another student who did have a lot of geometry experience said uh, a cone would be a cone when it was situated one way, but flipped upside down, it would be a triangle. So even though we're setting out to um, help give some bridges and some pathways for our students to solve these complex problems, we needed to go back to the basics. Um, if they don't have that understanding of what three-dimensional shapes are or how they can look in um, sketches or pictures, they're not going to be able to solve these problems. And so a good um, structure we found to talk about these gaps our students have are the Levels of Knowing Math by Mahesh Sharma. And the three we're focusing on today are concrete, pictorial, and abstract. And those are the ones where we found our students needed the most help.
And here are some quotes from Abby and Mai's observations of our students that really elucidate why we need to work on these areas. So from concrete to pictorial, the hands-on to the more sketches or images. Uh, the cone was incorrectly identified as a triangle by a student who has limited geometry experience. Once I brought out a 3D foam cone, she was able to identify the figure as a cone. So that hands-on actual physical cone helped her be able to identify the more abstracted picture. And so um, we'll also discuss moving from the pictorial to the abstract level, so from a picture to, a, to an abstract idea. So the example that we have of this was that some students said that looking at the formulas is like reading Braille. So um, I'm thinking this is from a person who doesn't know how to read Braille and that it just is, um, you know, looking at the formulas is, is not comprehensible to them. It, it, really, they, it really just doesn't make any sense. Okay, um, so looking at abstract to very abstract, so uh, clearly um, concrete, pictorial, and abstract are um, from Sharma's levels of knowing. Um, we sort of um, differentiated, just moving from um, pictures and images to um, more abstract terms, to getting even deeper into abstract, to abbreviations, um, to um, terms that are, for our students, um, pretty divorced from meaning. Uh, and here's a quote uh, from a teacher about um, dealing with um, some of the formulas on the GED um, formula sheet. And there's a lot um, to talk about with that formula sheet. Um, one of the questions might be, where's good old length times width times height? That, um, that's a formula a lot of us are comfortable with for volume. A couple things here. One, um, students, it's good to recognize to students that if they can do um, successful strong problem solving. They don't have to stay married to the formula sheet. But it's also good for students to be able to explain um, what is on the formula sheet and explain connections between um, the two formulas that they understand. Um, and if good old length times with times height was never conceptually understood why it works, what it means, um, then we're, we're, there's still an a, a instructional need there that we can fill. Um, but the bigger issue with abstract to very abstract is how do we take the unfamiliar and make it familiar and meaningful. And so really the, the question that we're working with during this webinar is, are your students getting enough experience with all of these levels? So, you know, um, rather than just focusing at that higher level, the complex problem, um, it's our idea that maybe students are not getting enough experience at the concrete to pictorial and back level, or maybe they're not getting enough experience going from pictorial to abstract and then from abstract back to pictorial, or um, maybe your students are not getting enough experience going from abstract to very abstract and, and back and forth among all of these levels. Um, so through this webinar, we are going to discuss some specific ways uh, that answer this question. How do we help learners develop thinking that moves from each of, each of these levels to, to the next level? All right, and I'm going to be talking about the first level, concrete to pictorial. Um, concrete is um, uh, we were supposed to present each new math fact through a concrete model, a hands-on model. And pictorial um, means that we should sketch or illustrate a model of each new math fact. And so on the left-hand side of your screen, you see some foam blocks. Um, this is a set that I have in my classroom that I use to make math problems more hands-on. And on the right, we just have a worksheet. And what we really discovered is there's such a leap to go from the actual shape on the left to that abstract worksheet on the right. As I mentioned before, those dashed lines on the worksheet to the right are really incomprehensible to some of our learners. And so I need actual practice abstracting those shapes to be those sketches. Once again, the student who was unable to identify this cone shape on the left as a cone and identified as a triangle. That's another type of learner who would need more practice with the hands-on actual shapes. 
And while those foam shapes are really great to use, um, you also can use realia, actual shapes. So if you had a foam like um, from the office where you get where you have watering fountains, you know that foam that paper cup thing that you have, or you could bring in an oatmeal container for a cylinder, or even a Kleenex box for a rectangular prism. Uh, those would work as well. So I'm going to guide you through a problem where I use these foam blocks just to really help my students develop some confidence. And um, in the problems I'm going to go through, we don't actually solve them. The whole goal is to just help my students re reduce that anxiety that they have in approaching these problems, which is also known as an effective barrier. It gets in the way of understanding. And also to build some vocabulary and some concepts so that one day they will be able to solve these problems. And as a teacher, you can decide if appropriate. Some of your students might be able to handle solving them. Other ones aren't quite ready yet, and you're still building that knowledge. Um, I also think it's really easy, since our students are adults, to just assume that um, they are able to know what these shapes are. Um, but what we've discovered is our students need more experience with these hands-on shapes. It's not true that they're able to jump um, right onto the way that they're shown on the GED in that flat form. Um, I personally find it really easy to show my students these foam shapes and then immediately expect them to draw a picture of them, but that's also skipping quite a few steps too. So um, yeah, let's go through this problem. Sample problem A. A set of wooden toy blocks contains cubes, cylinders, and square base pyramids. All of the blocks have a height of two inches. If no block is wider than it is tall, which of the three types of block has the largest volume? So with this problem, I would start with first bringing these shapes out, have my students touch them, and say, okay, so what are these called? And if they don't know, we'll start presenting the vocabulary. Even if they do, let's review the vocabulary. This problem talks about height. Where would height be on this cone? And eventually we would get to, all right, so let's select the shapes that are actually in this problem. And hopefully they would select the square base pyramid, cube, and cylinder, or you can guide them to that step. And then I'd say, okay, show me where the height is on these. I actually have them touch them and also point out that the height on the square base pyramid is a little bit different than on the cylinder and on the cube. It's not on the side like those other two. It's the straight up and down in the middle. And once again, talk about height and use the names of the shape again to build that capacity. And then, okay, so what math information do we have? We have that they are two inches. Okay, so the height is two inches on all of these. And also, so we're talking about volume. Where would volume be on this? Would volume be the inside part or the outside part? All right, volume is the part, so if we were to fill it all the way up with liquid, it would be in all of the inside area. You could talk about the difference between volume and surface area. All right, and so um, after using the actual foam blocks, uh, a good way for them to help begin being able to abstract them a bit more to get to the pictorial from the concrete is to present them with some ready-made sketches for them to choose. So during the live webinar, I had the participants select which one would go with the problem, and most people picked B. Good job, that is correct. And after you have your students select that sketch, I like to have them label it with the information presented in the problem. And then an extension of that is you can have your students actually create a sketch. And as I mentioned earlier, I find it really easy to bring, give them the shapes and then skip to this. Um, but I think it's really important to do this intermediary step where they actually select a sketch someone else has made so they can practice seeing it a bit more abstracted. All right. So now I'm going to go through another problem with a different way. Um, it is using geometric nets. All right, so sample problem B, how much juice could the box hold below if it was filled all the way? And once again, my section here is we're working on getting more hands-on concrete and then helping them get a little bit more abstract to the pictorial, the picture, the image one. So here's our problem here. It's about a juice box. So geometric nets, this is a homemade one. So basically, I just drew this out with a ruler and a marker on some paper. We do have ready-made ones that you can find online, but this is another option. Um, and a geometric net is just something that you or your students cut out and fold and tape together to make the actual three-dimensional shape. And it's a really great way to create some hands-on shapes for your students to interact with that go with a problem. 
Um, another helpful thing to help your students see the differences in the sides, also known as faces, is you could have them color them so then it's really clear um, which ones are different and which ones match. Also important is you can have your students measure them out and so they can see the different side lengths. Right? And then ultimately you have them fold and tape it together and then you can see your actual juice box. And I think once the students are able to see it put together like this, it just really helps them connect more in their mind. And then you talk about, all right, we can talk about length and width and height and the base. And the base is really important to mention too because in a lot of the GED formulas, you either need the perimeter or area of the base. And so once again, in this problem and in sample problem A, I didn't actually get to solving the problem with my students, although you could. I was just trying to build the vocabulary and build the concepts and give them more hands-on experience with the actual shape because that was a gap we had identified that our students had is not having enough actual experience with the shape. So here are pictures of some geometric nets that you can find online. If you Google them, there are a plethora um, of all different sizes and types. Um, another thing you can do with that is have your students color or label the base. Once again, those are really important for the GED formulas. And another thing you can have them do to test the knowledge, if your students are able to really abstract them a little bit more, is on the left-hand side of this worksheet we have the shape, and then they can match it to the actual net. And whether or not they can kind of see how the shape is made will be really helpful in manipulating the formulas, especially the complex formulas which we're trying, or complex problems which we're trying to help them build the skill set to do today. And so um, this is my summary slide. So these are all my different techniques I've been using to help my students build the concrete, the hands-on to pictorial strategies. So with those foam shapes, you can have those students select the actual shape, or you could use actual shapes, you know, tissue boxes, etc. And then point out the given information on the actual shape, select a sketch or image of the shape, and label the sketch or image with given information. Then after that, then they can make their own sketch, label the sketch, and then finally the last two are with geometric nets. They can color, measure, and label the nets and put them together. Um, okay, thank you for that, Kristen. Um, this is Amy, and I'm, I will continue by discussing the pictorial to abstract level. So um, now that, that students have spent time with concrete objects and converting those concepts into pictures, let's talk about now moving to the abstract level. So first, let's just take a minute and consider this question. What is abstract in a, in a GED level geometry prompt? So depending on the level of the student, just using written numerals can be considered abstract. So, you know, just the numeral four rather than four objects, that's already abstract. But um, to me, the most prominent abstract ideas at the GED level when you're working with geometry are variables and formulas. Um, and so, Let's just just think for a minute. What is the what is the purpose of a formula? How do you use formulas? So what formulas do are they they give us instructions, right? Formulas help us so that we don't have to figure out the entire problem solving process from the beginning every single time. So um, I understand that formulas then are for giving instructions, but the formulas on the GED formula sheet are composed of variables. So therefore, it's essential that your students have a solid understanding also of variables. And a variable is a letter that represents something. So for example, the variable L could represent the length, or the variable X could represent a person's age. And then the value of a variable can change depending on the context at hand. So 
let's get into this idea a little bit of, with variables and formulas. So imagine seeing this sign in your workplace. It says danger, E-C-K-A. So since this is a sign, I'm expecting it to communicate some type in, of instructions to me. However, these vari variables, E-C-K-A, these letters or variables have, have no meaning to me. So since I don't understand the meaning of the variables, the instructions have no meaning for me, and really I just feel scared because I see that something is dangerous, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, so it turns out that the ECKA stands for electric current, keep away. So now that I know that the variables stand for this, then the instructions make sense to me. So um, I just wanted to share this illustration because perhaps some of your students are having a similar experience when, when they're looking at the formula sheet. Okay, so let's come back to this question again. Um, what is a formula? So let's look at, look at um, one way to make formulas more approachable for your students. So here is, here is a formula. I see it, it's composed of variables. Um, so look at this formula and just think for a second. If, if, I can, if I tell you that W stands for being warm when you go outside, then what could those, what could those variables stand for? So if W stands for being warm when I go outside, what could those other variables stand for? And, um, you know, there's more than right, one right answer to this, but I was thinking that C could stand for coat, that M could stand for mittens, H could stand for hat, and S then could represent a scarf. So if I have a coat and two mittens and a hat and a scarf, the result will be that I'm warm when I go outside. So this is um, just an example of making formulas something that makes sense in daily life language and in daily life understanding and don't seem so um, so far away for, for students as they start to work with them. And so now here's another much more intimidating looking formula. Um, you can see here I had to use the letter B twice and so that led me to the having the B sub 1 and also B sub 2. So you can just wanted to show that you could introduce different notations by doing these exercises. Um, so uh, through this second formula, I was actually just trying to tell a little bit about what, what was happening to the balance in my, in my checking account. So, um, so B1, that's my initial balance. If I then add two checks and subtract two grocery bills, if I subtract my utilities and subtract my rent and subtract some other expenses, the result will be then the new balance in my checking account. So it's, there's just one more example of making formulas have a daily life meaning um, rather than such an abstract meaning. And, and, you know, just showing the idea that, that it's just a way to tell a story without having to write it all out as a whole paragraph. So um, one simple example that you could share with your students is you could ask them to write a formula to describe how to make a pizza. And so, of course, there would be many, many correct answers to this. And, um, and it would be fun for them to, to share those with each other. And so um, what I want to say here is just make sure that you're giving your students opportunities to tell stories using variables within formulas. Okay, so now there's this huge question, do formulas always work? So, you know, to me this is a great question to investigate with your students. So, yes. We can always multiply the length of a rectangle times its width to find its area, but you may also see a problem asking for the surface area of a cylinder in which the circular lid is not included in the solution. So the more that you and your students know and understand about formulas, then the more useful they can be to you. 
So um, now that we have, now that we've explored the meaning of abstract with the, within the GED geometry prompt, let's look at some activities that you could do with students to move from the pictorial to the abstract levels. So I just have two sample activities that I'd like to share. So here's the activity number one. Given images of shapes and their measures, ask learners to make a table that includes columns for dimension, variable, and value. So um, you could give images like the one that you see on the screen, or perhaps your students made them, if like how Kristen was talking about. Um, maybe they made these sketches and labeled them. But once your students have these, then let's transition to that abstract level. You could give them a blank table with dimension, variable, and value listed, and then you know, then it would be their, you would, it would be their work to write the word height. You know, that's one dimension that's given. And then the variable that often represents height is h. And then in this particular, in this particular case, then the height is 64 inches. And um, also the diameter, which is often represented by d, which in this case is 28 inches, would be, would be another more information that they could fill in. And then, um, then other additional dimensions could be added to this. So um, to me, I think of this as a really great way to differentiate when you have different level learners in your class. So for some, this, this might be enough for this prompt. Um, some students then would be able to find the radius um, of the bases, or maybe you have students that could go ahead and find the volume or find the surface area by, by using the formula sheet. So um, really just adjust this activity to meet the levels, the different levels of your students. Okay, and then so for sample activity number two, this is a get up and move around the room kind of activity. So what you could do is ask your students to find the person who is their match with a matching formula or image. So perhaps one student could have this piece of paper and then the other student could have this second with a formula on it. So the students would be asked to, to find the formula or find the image that, that matches. And so in this case, the, the volume of this um, rectangular prism is given, and we're asked to find the height. So this volume formula would be one that I could use in order to answer this question. So these students would find each other walking around the room. They would they would find each other, and of course they would have to be talking and um, making arguments as they went along and and sorted out who their partner was. And then, so once everyone has found their match, then you could give the, give the instructions that together, either on a section of your board or on poster paper, um, the students could sketch and label the image and also write the formula. And so, um, but then after that, ask them to write three sentences that describe how they know that, that this was the correct match. And um, again, you know, this will just be such a great opportunity to open discussion among the students and in the small groups and then also when they share out. Um, and it's a, just a great way for your students to be, to be using the math vocabulary words. All right, so um, now we're going to look at um, strategies to help students bridge from um, an understanding of abstract ideas to some very um, abstract ideas and tools. Um, so the top formula here is a formula off of the formula sheet, and the bottom formula is clearly an invented one. Um, I think um, both of them, um, at first glance, you may look at them and say, or one might look at them and say, hmm, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. Um, Working uh, with numbers is already abstract. Working with symbols is abstract. Working with abbreviations is even further removed from the concrete reality. Um, 
So I know I'm probably not alone. When I first looked at the formula sheet, there were some formulas, formulas that I needed help translating. Um, and I needed to get more familiar and comfortable with them. Um, we saw that quote from a student who said, um, looking at the formulas is like reading Braille. Um, familiarity with things will make them more connected to the concrete and more, can make them more connected to the concrete and more easy to manipulate. Um, but again, just to touch on the CCRS standards, we're thinking about um, standard one, uh, make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Standard four, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Math mathematical practice one, mathematical practice for model with mathematics, um, which is about um, using uh, math to represent and describe uh, everyday life. And um, mathematical practice five, use appropriate tools strategically. Um, we can think of these formulas as tools that we want our students to be able to use comfortably and strategically. Um, but the problem isn't just that these um, formulas can be confusing or um, lack meaning for our students. Um, it's also something that's meant to be helpful um, that can seem very frightening to our students. Um, so, and the, the problem there is, um, Kristen touched on the idea of the effective filter, which is the idea that when, um, when our um, anxiety or concern is raised, a filter comes up in our mind that makes it hard for us to process and learn. Um, I think we probably all had the experience at one point or another that um, we are trying to pay attention to something, but it either reminds us of something that makes us um, nervous or um, the thing itself is making us nervous and we're not able to take in the information. Um, so we need to find um, ways to help students um, work around this because um, we found in our focus groups, and you may have seen in your classroom, some students, they knew they needed to use the formula, but they were actively avoiding using the formulas. And I had one student, and I know we each had this experience, where he wouldn't even start the problem. Um, and I knew he had the math skills to do it, but he was just so intimidated or um, freaked out by the problem that he didn't want to start. Um, all right. So how do we make these accessible to our students? Um, as part of the focus groups that Chris and I did, we um, not only had students solve and talk to us about what they tried or what worked or what didn't work, but we had them um, work together and we listened as they explained and asked each other questions. Um, and one student I told her that um, we were going to use her um, ideas today um, had been more, one of the more comfortable, one of the more proficient problem solving, problem solvers, and she had some really good tips about that mathematical practice five using tools strategically. So another student was asking her, well, how did you know which formula to use? And her suggestion was to look at the problem and figure out, ask yourself a series of questions. So her first question was, what was given in this problem? And for the problem they were working on, it was diameter and volume. And then the student said, the next question you should always ask yourself is, what is this problem asking us to find? Um, and for that problem, what they needed to find was height. Um, so then she said to look at the formulas down that formula sheet, and which formulas mention the things you were, um, when, mention the things that you need to find. So they went through and they looked for ones um, that they thought were relevant that involved height. Um, let's see. Um, that for them, that, that, that they were able to, from that step, narrow it down to um, just one formula. If they hadn't been, the student recommended asking which of these formulas will use what you're given um, and still, has, still will lead you to what you need to find. Um, and we just add to this that uh, we need to also help our students understand that sometimes um, they'll have to do this in two steps using two formulas, like in the sample cone problem we looked at earlier. Um, but I think this is a really um, clear way to give the students a concrete thing to do to get started, to get past um, some of that uh, anxiety that can come with um, this com com complex abstract thinking, um, and also kind of give them a solving plan, which we know is helpful with all kinds of problem solving. All right. Um, uh, so Kristen and Amy have mentioned um, the idea of vocabulary, and um, certainly this is a big um, piece of what is um, confusing to our students about moving into these deeper areas of math. So the more that we can um, help our students know and feel comfortable using these vocabulary words, um, and there's lots of activities we're going to talk about some within the resources that we can have our students do to help them build up this vocabulary. And this isn't just for English language learners, although some of the vocabulary learning strategies that we know work for English language learners are going to be extremely useful for all of our students as math has a set of vocabulary that's unfamiliar to all of them. Um, if the student knows that a distance across the distance across the top of a cone is three inches, but they can't connect that to the word diameter or the word radius, or if they can't connect it to the 
letter R that's in the formula or the D that's in the formula, it can make the formulas really hard to use. So I would advocate for explicit, intentional, and embedded vocabulary development um, for all of our um, students, not just the English language learners. All right, um, so going a little deeper into the farther abstract, um, the students need to know um, that the formulas are using abbreviations of the words and they need to be able to make sense of what those abbreviations mean. And I know that uh, Amy began to address this in her section. Um, so if they can see that same cone three inches across, and maybe they even know it's um, the diameter, but they don't know what, what, what the different um, abbreviations in the formula means, they're still stuck to use that tool. Um, I've been doing some activities with my students um, since doing those focus groups where I've been having them take a formula and then translate it into a written out sentence where they're writing a word for each one or even just like a literally cut and paste matching activity where they're matching um, the word, matching some words to the different um, letters in the formula uh, or taking the shapes as Christian described, cutting up the formula and sticking the pieces of the formula onto the um, parts of the shape it represents, and then for the ones that aren't on the visual shape, labeling what those mean. Um, I know that um, a challenge for uh, many of us here is time, that um, this is one chunk, of one subject that we need to address, um, and um, we're talking about sort of going deep and expanding what we need to teach, and there, there are trade-offs there in terms of how do we fit everything in. Uh, and I'm not saying I have a solution for that, but I do think decreasing our students' anxiety, increasing their confidence as um, uh, individuals who are able to solve complex problems and really um, helping them make meaning of the formulas has a lot of benefits that may be worth that investment of time. Um, sort of an aside, um, in the, as we're talking about the, the um, formulas and um, what was confusing about them, the font is an issue. I know some um, programs have taken the GED formula sheet for a variety of reasons and made a um, version of it that they use within their program, I would really recommend at least some of the time to use the formula sheet as it's given by the GED because um, some of our students had trouble understanding some of the formulas they were familiar with or some of the symbols they were familiar with um, because they do not recognize them in the way they are written on the GED formula sheet. And we listened to a couple conversations where students asked each other what TT was in the formula and it turned out that the way that pi is written on the formula sheet, it looks like two letter T's next to each other. Um, and once the student was, once it was pointed out that that TT was actually the symbol pi. The students that were asking the question knew. They said, oh yeah, that's pi 3.14. It has to do with um, circumference or whatever, but they didn't recognize it. And also, um, the way that um, S and um, B are used, particularly capital B and lowercase b have different meanings. Um, it's something that was unfamiliar to um, not only a lot of um, students, but a lot of instructors as well. So it's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for instruction there. Okay, um, so for the next um, portion, I want to address um, some um, materials, and these aren't my materials, these are still images from materials um, that were um, put out by Andrew Stadel and Dan Meyer, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about their resources, but I won't have time to do them justice, so I want to say that um, the um, website for that I, where I, from where I got these particular images is on, the, on your screen now, but also um, I posted, put, we put links to um, those teachers' websites on um, the formula, I'm sorry, the, on the resource sheet, so you'll be able to check them out, but we just wanted to give them credit here. So, um, Andrew Stadel, Dan Meyer, um, Fawn Wynn, and a group of other teachers um, are doing some amazing things in their classroom, and um, bonus for all of us, they're um, posting it in the internet about it. So there's a, a variety of sites where they're posting their work. Um, and Dan Meyer um, has been, for a while now, sharing these ideas about what he calls three-act lessons, um, and I won't have time today to really do justice to um, the really cool things that are involved in um, what they're working on in their classrooms and what they're um, talking about on the web, so I highly recommend checking them out. Um, but a, a core of what they're talking about as I see it is um, that these three act lessons and the materials that have grown out of the related, grown out of the related conversations, um, the, um, they're interested in presenting problem solving in a really engaging way, in a way that engages the student's curiosity. Um, they are um, in some ways um, more um, true to real life than the realistic problems we might be solving in our uh, math textbooks. Um, they often have a reduced literacy load. Um, the stills that you're looking at are from a video that literally has no words in it, so they're success accessible to a variety of students. Um, they have a low floor and a high ceiling, meaning students can start with what they know, um, but they can go on to have a really complex and interesting mathematical conversation based on the materials. Um, they have ha the I think the tools, because they are low literacy load, because um, they're engaging and interesting to watch, 
they, have the, they give us the opportunity to really lower our students effective filter and they don't look like the um, stereotypical math test problem that a lot of us are familiar with so the things that for especially for adult students that that baggage that we're all carrying with us about the freaky red pen math test doesn't necessarily get pulled up as we look at these problems um, so it allows for um, some really comfortable um, and maybe more natural um, language development and language acquisition as well. Um, lots of chances to meaningfully embed vocabulary. So um, I, uh, I would ask, um, and this is again based on the work of um, the teachers I referenced earlier, we look at these pictures and we think, what um, geom geometry related questions might these images bring up? And let me just say, um, in the video, um, the teacher puts down this um, set of post-it notepads, this pen, and the cabinet you see on the right does a turn so you can see um, the four sides of it. Um, so as you watched, if you were to watch that video or if you were to look at these pictures, what questions um, might come up? And let me say the video goes on, oops, the video goes on, he starts putting these post-it notes along um, the, the um, cabinet face, um, says nothing, and it pauses about um, by that second picture, he kind of walks off screen. Um, and this is a question that we could ask other teachers, but this is also where we could start with our students. Um, thanks again to the people that attended the live webinar. They suggested questions like, what is the surface area of the cabinet? How big is one post-it note? What is the surface area of one side of the cabinet? How many post-it notes could cover this filing cabinet? How many post-it notes will cover this side of the filing cabinet? What is the surface area of a rectangular prism? Um, do you have to cover the whole thing to solve this problem? Um, how many post-it notes fit on the cabinet? What's the area of the cabinet? Um, how many packages or stacks of post-it notes do we need to finish this task? Um, how big is one post-it note, I think, is a um, great question. Um, when we give our students, well, for me, when I was opening up giving my students the open-ended opportunity to ask mathematical questions about um, what they had seen, um, I had a little trouble processing what I was going to do. Um, it was like um, uh, opening up a million roads at once, right? I know I'm not going to be able to take my students down every road there. Um, but I realized that those are actually opportunities where they're getting to make um, connections with the mathematics and the intuitive level of knowing. So we may not be solving every question they come up with, um, but they're seeing real life applications for some of the math and it gives us touch points to come back to later. Um, I love the question, how big is one post-it note, um, because it gives us a chance to meaningfully talk about units. And I think um, unit is a term that we um, have seen a lot in math, but I think it doesn't have a lot of meaning for a lot of our students. Um, so what a great opportunity to um, have that meaningful conversation and, and open up that vocabulary with students. Um, we might ask, um, will the, we might then move into asking facilitating questions to pick one road to go down in terms of what problem we're going to solve or address. Um, and talk about, um, will the same number of post-its be on all the sides? Um, can we predict the number of post-its are going to be on this side? What would be helpful to know to predict the post-its on the other sides? And if I unfolded the cabinet, what would the shape of the um, flat piece of metal be? How could we figure out the length of that shape? Um, are we looking at surface area or volume, and how do we know? Um, one of the um, folks that I shared this with um, mentioned um, that they might ask a question about the volume of the cabinet. Um, and at first I was um, surprised, but I think, again, it was a really um, neat opportunity to talk about the difference between surface area and volume. Um, it also gives us chances to meaningfully use abstract terms. So if a student already knows some of the questions mentioned, surface area, a term that might be from unfamiliar to other students, what a great opportunity to ask some of those students to um, explain the meaning. If no one's using the term, there's a chance for me to take the vocabulary they're using and use it as the working definition for the term that I want to introduce. Um, in, um, for the, those of you that are English language um, teachers, um, we know language acquisition strategies will often, without correcting, model back. The student says the man tall, and I say, right, the tall man. Um, so it's another opportunity, it's a similar opportunity here with these, when the student says, um, it's 12 post-it notes um, up the side, or it's 12 post-it notes tall. I can say, I think we're talking about height. Would it be comfortable if I use the word height to describe the 12 post-it notes you're talking about? Um, I can also, um, again, meaningfully use abbreviations. So as we take notes, either I'm taking notes on the board or students take notes on the board or students taking notes on a piece of paper, um, I can point out opportunities to use um, the H or the L or the R um, 
to represent that thing we're talking about and to save us from having to write the word radius um, over and over again. Um, these tools, um, the abbreviating, the vocabulary, the purpose of them isn't just to make math a club that um, only um, the math fluent can be part of, but the purpose is um, to make it um, smoother and more efficient to solve math problems. And I think um, this type of complex problem gives us a chance to um, not only model that, but to give students a chance to meaningfully do that with um, the abbreviations and the vocabulary. Um, again, um, the um, three ACT lessons that um, these teachers are um, sharing uh, have a, a, more rich, a level of richness that I'm not going to be able to go through into here, um, but those are available um, on the, the links are available on the resource page. I would highly recommend checking them out. Um, and if you are a teacher who's using them in your classroom, I'd be really interested to know um, what you're doing with them and um, how, you know, how you've um, adapted them for your classroom. So this is another problem. Again, the link is um, on the um, screen. There will also be, there will also be links in the resource page. Um, in the video, um, these two images are in the same shot. Um, so I've um, just cut them and enlarged them here to make them fit on, the, on, on your screen. Um, so there is a pan of sauce and a, that is bubbling on the stove and there is um, a um, dish of um, frozen meatballs. Um, and we um, can use this as a beginning for another low floor, high ceiling project geometry problem um, for, uh, to give our students opportunities to make meaningful use of formulas. Um, so uh, in the video, um, we know that the meatballs are likely about to be dropped into the sauce. We can ask our students what questions might arise. Um, so again, going back to our um, live webinar participants, um, folks had great questions, starting with things like what shape, what shapes do you see what, um, in the uh, video? Um, or if they're naming what they see, asking them what shapes they are. Um, what shape is the pot of sauce? How many meatballs? Can we make an abbreviation for meatballs? Um, having giving students an opportunity to, to sketch what they see, um, writing equations, um, asking questions about how many meatballs would fit in there and would it matter if you broke up the meatballs or kept them um, as whole uh, spheres. Um, there were also questions about the ratio of sauce to um, meatball. Um, some people um, using the term ratio explicitly and some just saying, do we have enough sauce or would you want more sauce? Again, what a cool opportunity to um, tie something um, that we have real life experience with, I want more sauce on my food, <laughs> to um, the idea of ratios. Um, my goal wasn't ratios and when I was working with this word problem, um, but I, I mean, I'm sorry, with this visual problem, I think it's a great opportunity to either reuse this problem for another um, um, mathematical lesson, or at least to give students a touch point to another place where ratios are part of real life. Okay, um, and then just to touch back the mathematical practices. Um, practice one, making sense of problems and persever perseverance solving them. Um, these types of lessons are a great opportunity. Um, math practice three, construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. If you have students either in person or through writing, um, communicating about um, their thoughts about this, um, video, great opportunities there. Practice four, model with mathematics. Um, practice five, use appropriate tools strategically. Lots of opportunities for um, discussion with a lot of the mathematical practices. Okay. Um, Dan Meyer suggests that asking questions about um, the little and the big numbers um, involved. So what number do you know, well, of meatballs do you know would make this pot overflow? And what number do you know is too few meatballs to make the pot overflow? Um, I love those questions because for a lot of reasons. Um, one is I think um, giving students an opportunity to um, jump in with those numbers is really low stress. I know that if I come up with a number like 10 million, it's definitely going to be too many. And I know if I come up with a number like one or zero meatballs, it's definitely going to be too few to make it overflow. So it's a safe way to jump in and start having a mathematical, meaningful mathematical discussion. And so for those students who are kind of frozen up by an effective filter, um, what a cool opportunity to jump in. Um, Kristen and Amy are going to talk a little bit about how they might use some of this um, fodder to jump into the areas of um, uh, mathematical instruction that I talked about earlier. All right, so after I drop my headset and pick it back up, <laughs> uh, 
um, so let's say you show this to your students and whether it's the video or these pictures, it's a pictorial representation. And so let's say your students aren't quite getting it, they don't really know the shapes, um, how could we make this more concrete for them? So just take a minute to reflect, remember those strategies I had earlier, maybe those foam blocks or um, geometric nets, how could you make this more concrete for them? And immediately what I think of is bringing in realia, or you could use those foam shapes. So realia, like you could bring in an actual pot um, with something that represents the sauce in it. Water would probably be less messy. And you could, for the um, meatballs, bring in a pyrex and then some spheres to represent the meatballs. And let's say you are experimenting with how many meatballs you could put into the sauce until it would overflow it. You could actually practice doing that a little bit. And through that you could talk about, okay, so... All right, this pot, what shape is that? Okay, that's a cylinder, right? Okay. And um, the meatballs, what shape are those? Are spheres. So you can either review or develop the vocabulary that way. So even though this is pictorial, it might still be too abstract for some of our learners. So bringing hands-on things, similar shapes, or the actual objects themselves would help them connect a bit more to this. All right, so I'm going to pass this off to Amy to talk about the next stages of the levels of knowing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so then with the same prompt, you could work with your students on moving from pictorial to abstract. So um, this, is, this is kind of funny because this is a picture, I guess. We're looking at it. It's a picture, but it's um, uh, not a sketch, which is a, a sketch is an abstract version of these pictures, right? So... Um, so one thing you could do is, is to make it a little more abstract is just to have your students sketch, sketch these um, figures. So once you say, what are, the, what are the figures that you see here? And you know, what, are the, what are they called? And then you could ask for sketches of each of those. And then um, you know, students could label the components. You know, if they could identify the a cylinder in this image somewhere, then, you know, then what are the, um, you know, what are the key interesting elements of a cylinder that, that often come up in math problems? And that would be things like the, like the height or like the diameter. And so they could, they could make a sketch, they could label that sketch, and then you could even ask them to get in to the, um, the, filling in the table activity that we did. So maybe as a group then, if they could list all of the dimensions that, that are visible here, then the next step would be, well, what are the variables that often represent those dimensions? And then, um, and then you know, we don't see them here, but is that maybe that's something that they could measure. Right? Maybe if you have the realia there, then they could actually measure to find the actual um, values of, of each of those variables in this particular scenario. And um, again, I really think this is a great opportunity for differentiation. So for a higher level group of students, you could have them pull out the formula sheet and talk about which formulas even though that we don't even have a specific question, which formulas could bring more meaning to the situation and, and that they could just develop that skill of being able to sift through the formula sheet and, um, and select, select the formulas that, that contribute meaning to the, to the prompt at hand. So um, Abby, go ahead and, and tell us about the next level. All right. Um, so um, I think uh, Amy made a good point that there's so, like there would be multiple layers at which, which you can access this, um, use these materials to access different levels of students, um, differentiate instruction. Um, let's see. Um, so I think you could have your students come up with a question. Um, I might um, just as an example go with how many meatballs can we add until it overflows. Um, and I think that's the one that um, Dan Meyer mod models on this website. Um, and we talked a, little, a little bit earlier about um, sort of letting them open up with some guessing. Um, but then where you take it from there, um, you may go through and want 
um, a group of students to walk through the actual technical solving of the problem. It may be enough to discuss the problem um, and listen for opportunities uh, to provide um, useful instruction, either in um, math skills or that students st stumble upon, they want to know, well, how would I figure out this from this, um, or um, in academic language. So um, again, academic language uh, allows for precision. So if there's an opportunity to introduce a term like diameter that might help them um, uh, clearly speak about the things they're describing. Um, it's a really meaningful way to introduce some of that vocabulary or some of those math skills. Um, for example, if the students are talking about um, displaced sauce, they're talking about how much sauce is going to spill when they drop in the last meatball, um, they're talking about a working definition of volume. So what a cool opportunity to, to um, use that vocabulary, introduce or, or um, review that vocabulary that way. Um, Meyer suggests that as the students discuss, um, we can ask what information will be useful in helping you figure this out. Um, and on his web page, um, that's linked here, um, you'll see that some ways that he reveals some of that information as, as students figure out they need it. Um, so um, what a great way to drive instructions to students' um, interest and curiosity and, and um, they've already, they're, while they're already having meaningful thinking. Um, uh, which um, is a good connection to mathematical practice two, to reason abstractly and quantitatively. All right, and mathematical practice three, modeling with math. Um, students um, can and will take notes um, during the solving activity, and the abbreviations that I mentioned earlier become really useful. Um, so if we're talking about meatball, it becomes confusing, right? Because we're we talking about the volume of the meatball, or the diameter of the meatball, or the surface area of the meatball. So it gives us a way to use either the abbreviation or the actual word as we start taking notes on the um, uh, mathematical details, the uh, informational details that we're going to need if we want to be able to solve how many meatballs we can add before the pot overflows. All right, um, so let's take a moment and look at some of the um, other resources uh, that we want to refer you to. Um, so I've been mentioning the resource page, and um, this will be available to you um, here on the um, screen. You'll see the geometry for the 2014 uh, GED resource page. Um, some of the worksheets that um, Kristen mentioned earlier um, are linked here, so with uh, 3D nets. Um, also, as we looked through um, the internet, we found so many good resources that are sort of either offering a um, 3D geometry complex problem, or just really lend themselves to um, teachers or students creating some really cool, interesting um, 3D problems or activities. So. Um, since we weren't able to include every single example in today's webinar, they're listed here for you to um, go through and um, integrate into your classroom. Um, down at the bottom, um, there are links to um, uh, the um, websites from a variety of the teachers that I mentioned earlier, um, Estimation 180, um, uh, Fawn Wynn's um, website, um, she has an example where she has her students find the volume of a donut. Um, and as well as some of the three act lessons that we um, talked about uh, earlier in the webinar. Um, as I looked at some of the um, uh, materials available and, th and the bridges that we talked about today, I started just making a list for myself of some warm-up ideas. This list is by, in no, me by no means exhaustive, um, but just some um, short bursts that you could do with your class, some ideas um, to share about um, Things you might want your students to do to build some of these skills that we've talked about today. And then this this handout is called Interpreting the 2014 GED Test Math Formula Sheet. And um, some of you may have seen this at Summer Institute at the math pre-conference a few years ago. Um, but I have revised it now to match the current formula sheet. And it's just a visual interpretation of what is on the formula sheet. So um, just to, to bring, to use the language of this webinar, to just build a bridge to, so that, the, that some of those variables can just be a little, be seen in a more visual context. So it's, um, this is for you, for your students, um, to just to help understand the um, GED 
formula sheet a little bit better. So um, I know there are a lot of worksheets available on the internet that have um, 3D shapes. Um, Kristen showed some, um, and there are links to them where you, get, you can have students match um, the shape uh, unfolded. There, and there are certainly some where you can label the parts. Um, we made this one because um, we wanted a, sh a sheet that was limited to the 3D shapes and 2D shapes that are on um, the GED formula sheet. So um, we were finding resources that brought in other shapes, and when we're so pressed for time in our classes, um, some of us have made the decision to just focus on the ones the GED is covering. So this is a sheet that has the 3D shapes and 2D shapes that the um, GED is covering, and it asks students to either shade or label um, the parts of the shape that are, um, or the aspects of the shape that come up in the formulas, um, so that we are again um, reviewing kind of how the um, abstract and visual are connected. And so that's available to you and your students. All right, um, and this worksheet here has got multiple different levels. Um, first, we have some word problems developed by Amy. And next, we have some sketches for your students to match with the problems. As you notice, some of them are from the actual sketches we used for this webinar and the actual problems. Um, to step it up a level, you can have your students then create your own sketch. And for those that are ready, you can have them match it to an equation. And also for the sketches that they select and the sketches that they draw, you can have them uh, label them with a the given information. So once again, this is kind of a choose your own adventure for the appropriate level for your students. You can even go all the way to solve them while that's listed as C for a bonus on this. Um, there are a couple of here that aren't geometry problems, so feel free to remove them. But this process is helpful for other types of math problems as well. The last we have are these modified cone problems, or the ones Abby and I piloted with our students. We have a more complex problem and a more basic problem, and also we have some questions to help our students tap into that metacognition, them thinking about thinking, thinking about the process of what they're doing to solve these problems. Um, and so you're welcome to use these, adapt them, make copies for your classroom, and they will be available on the Atlas website. Oh, okay, so I just wanted to remind everyone as we conclude this webinar that, that uh, this webinar is part of a series, the EQIP series. We are in Season 2, um, and so please join us for any webinars that are still coming up, and know that any ones that have already happened are recorded and can be found at the Atlas website. And the Atlas website that we keep referring to, the web address is listed there on your screen. And I want to let you know that Episode 5 registration is open right now. And um, in case this is the first recorded EQIP episode that you've, that you've seen, I just want to um, tell you that, that these webinars are actually very interactive. And this was just, um, since it was a rebroadcast, then we did it a little differently. But please join us for Episode 5, which will be a very interactive webinar. Um, and thank you, Abby and Kristen, for, for sharing this helpful information today. <laughs>